In this video, we're gonna talk about from sandpaper to Fortune 500 company, the success story of 3M. So before starting this video, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for future updates. A mining corporation that was founded on an error persevered until a young man with inventions that could be made from those errors appeared, sparking decades of expansion. Minnesota mining and manufacturing is the origin of the phrase 3M. However, those 3Ms can actually stand for mistake, equal to magic, equal to money. Numerous groundbreaking items developed by 3M over the course of its 101-year history have followed a similar path. A 3M engineer expresses optimism about being able to resolve a problem that a 3M customer has identified. He repeatedly fails and hits a brick wall for years before management eventually instructs him to stop wasting time and money. Unfazed, the engineer finds a solution and transforms a failure into a resounding victory. Many businesses frequently discuss allowing employees the flexibility to make errors. But 3M managed to work randomness into company policy, which helped it go from floundering startup to mainstay of the Fortune 500. When Bill Hewlett of Hewlett Packard was asked for a business role model by Jim Collins and Jerry Purse, co-authors of the best-selling Bell to Last 1994, he responded, 3M. You never know what new idea they will have next. The beauty of it is that they most likely have no idea what will be their next idea. Despite the fact that William McKnight, the person behind 3M's entrepreneurial culture, was not the company's founder, he should nonetheless be given credit for what made 3M successful during his 59 years there and beyond. Two values from McKnight's founding of the McKnight Foundation in 1953. According to McKnight's great-grand-daughter, Noah Stark, our innovation and taking risks. McKnight unintentionally ended up at 3M. He had applied for a labor's work with the company in 1906. And by the time it sought to engage him as a bookkeeper the following year, he had already made up his mind to take a job elsewhere. However, after learning that his mother was ill, he declined the job offer and made plans to return home only to find out that she had made a full recovery. 3M was the only alternative left. He ended up being the best thing that ever happened to the business. The founding of 3M seems like the start of a terrible joke. In Two Harbors, Minnesota, a business is established in 1902 by a lawyer, a doctor, two railroad executives, and a butcher with the hope of becoming wealthy. Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing established its operations to mine corundum, a super hard substance that could be used to create high quality grinding wheels. The company was rapidly known as 3M, though that wasn't its official name until this year. But according to Virginia Huck in Brand of the Tartan, the 3M story, 1955, like so many others who founded mining ventures in the early 1900s, the founders of 3M presumably incorporated first and investigated later. And their corundum became a problem. It was a mushy rock, a subpar abrasive rather than a valued material. By the end of 1904, 3M stock had reached an all-time low on the barroom exchange, with two shares going for a short of cheap whiskey. The purpose of 3M has abruptly vanished. The founders changed their strategy went straight into the abrasive industry by producing their own sandpaper, despite the fact that their corundum was essentially useless as an abrasive. To manufacture the sandpaper, 3M relocated to Dublin, Minnesota, but the area's high humidity frequently prevented the material from drying correctly. A bashful, red-haired, 20 years old named William McKnight joined the cast of this comedy of errors as an assistant bookkeeper. When I applied for that position, I was the scaredest boy that ever lived, he recalled. His strengths, according to Huck, were a five-month, extremely brief business school education, inborn tenacity, and great desire. Nobody could have possibly known when the quiet, devote boy applied for the job that he would quickly become a crucial factor in the 3M success. 
Despite having a quiet voice, McKnight was straightforward and effective. When he was sales manager in 1911, he instituted the practice of traveling into the back room with a client's workers so he could show them 3M products and hear about their needs as opposed to simply dropping off a catalog with a purchasing agent in front office. He came to the conclusion that 3M sandpaper was at best uneven and at worst subpar. He thought that the organization required someone to help sales and production communicate better in order to improve quality control. McKnight was named general manager in 1940 after upper management decided that he was the ideal candidate for the position. Naturally, his rent began with a mistake. When sales were at roughly $22,000 per month and the business was profitable, irate customers abruptly started returning 3M sandpaper. It turned out that a consignment of 3M abrasive had several casks of olive oil spilt on it while in transit and the oil-tainted sand lost its adhesion to the supporting paper. And nobody had seen the issue. Following that disaster, McKnight set up a research facility to examine materials throughout the entire production process. The first lab employees, William Weavering, recalled that it was a rudimentary, closet sized affair, but it was a crucial first step. I had to back out when Mr. McKnight wanted to come and he said. In the end, McKnight's decision to focus the company on research had the dual effects of both testing and developing ideas. His guiding principle of listen to everybody with an idea established the tone for the meeting. In 1920, McKnight wanted to know what the correspondent would do with the bulk mineral samples he had been sent by an ink producer not a client of the 3 M's, Francis Oki, a Philadelphia-based inventor who wished to advance his creation of the waterproof sandpaper, had sent the note. Oki's invention had less friction than dry sandpaper and didn't produce dangerous dust when used wet, so McKnight knew it would be quickly adopted. He acquired the intellectual property rights hired Oki, and by 1921, 3M had produced wet or dry sandpaper, the company's first groundbreaking item. Every idea should have a chance to prove its worth, and this is true for two reasons. One, if it is good, we want it. Number two, if it is not good, we will have purchased peace of mind when we have proven it impractical, wrote Richard Carlton, director of manufacturing at 3M and author of the company's first testing manual. The maximum of Carlton, you can't stumble if you're not in motion, perfectly describes how 3M began as an adhesive manufacturer and developed into a diversified business. Engineer Richard Drew, who had been doing some wet or dry testing at a St. Paul auto body shop, remembered, I strolled in one morning in 1923 and heard the choicest vulgarity I had ever experienced. A two-tone automobile, which was common at that time, had a portion that the painter was having problems painting while masking. Because they left a residue or reacted with the pen, the majority of taps at the time were inadequate for the job. Drew convinced the panner that his business could find a solution. An intriguing boast given that 3M was the only manufacturing of abrasive at the time. For two years, Drew worked on the issue. When he was helping Mr. Oki with his waterproof sandpaper, McKnight, who was the then vice president, once wrote him a message saying, I think it would be better if you return to your work, Drew did, but he persisted in making the masking tap and while doing an arrange for Oki, he finally discovered that the proper backing paper, which had been his prior sticking point, the tap known as Scotch Masking Tap, became an instant hit with first year sales of $164,279 climbing to $1.15 million a decade later. Drew developed cell phone tabs as a follow-up creation, which was even more successful for the business. Drew, who had been promoted from a lab assistant to technical director, Seabox, was assisting a client with the challenge of seeing their insulation material and in moisture-proof packaging. One of the team members tested cell phone wrapping 3M masking tab as they were working on it. Drew wondered, why the cell phone could be covered with glue and used as ceiling tap when he saw it. 
It resists dampness. In spite of the fact that it didn't resolve the insulation manufacturer's issue, the business released it in 1930. The origin of the name Scotch for both drove steps is unknown, but a widely repeated and probably untrue myth claims that one of Drew's early masking tap prototypes didn't have enough adhesive and kept coming off the car, prompting the panel using it to say, take this tap back to those Scotch bosses of yours and have them put more adhesive on it. Ironically, that allusion to then common stereotype that Scots were frugal suited 3M well to bring the Great Depression. When Scott's cell phone tap rose to prominence as a sign of frugality and do-it-yourself repair. After the invention of masking tap, McKnight discovered how important it is to let his engineers make their own decisions. He quickly incorporated this knowledge into a rule known as the 15-person rule. He instructed his managers to encourage exploratory doodling. You get sheep if you put fences around humans. Give everyone the space they require. The regulation, which is still in effect today, allows 3M engineers to devote up to 15% of their working hours to whatever project they want. The subsequent 25-person rule, which mandated that each division generate a quarter of its sales from products introduced within the past five years, which in 1993 became the 30-person rule, and Genesis Grants, an internal venture capital fund available to engineers whose ideas have been rejected by management, furthered 3M's climate of innovation. The ultimate result was a continual stream of innovations, each one including an audible aha moment that would later become legendary. What do you think about this video? Do let us know down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear from us again, be sure to hit the subscribe button before you go.